Good morning. Um, I'm going to start out uh, this morning and just ask you, uh, you, most of you probably realize we're black back in the red zone, and uh, I'm going to let you all decide whether or not we're going to meet for a couple of weeks. Um, now, last time, I think it was only two weeks, and it, we went back down, but uh, what do you all feel? You want to keep meeting, or you want to take a couple of weeks off? Don't everybody speak at once. There's 13. Yeah, we're distanced. <laughs> well, any other any other thoughts? I mean, I'm really letting you. I mean, whatever you thirteen say is what we're going to do. <laughs> They would say, keep on going, wouldn't they? <laughs> I know your mama. She, that's exactly how she is. Well, if I can get the people that sit in the first three rows there to spread out, that would be great. But they sit in those first three rows. There's, you know... I know, not you. You're fine. You're fine today. But you know what I'm saying? Glenn and Karen and, and uh, Mike, they just sit. They won't spread out, you know. You know, they just won't do it. So They don't want to lose their place. Is that what it is? Oh, of course not. Yeah, if you live, if you're in a family living together, there's nothing. But I mean, you know. Well, that and that would be just fine with me. She just said she, if her husband was still living, she'd be sitting on his lap. I think that'd be neat. Well, Bill, how do you 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 okay with me? All right. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and meet. It sounds like we've got more, you know, if, like I said, <laughs> this side that used to be full 30 years ago, but I realize that w most of those people have died, and it just, it breaks my heart, but, you know, that's why this side's empty. You know, we've got, you know. But, yeah, you all are doing great. You're skipping a row. Fantastic, just like you're supposed to. But, uh, okay, so we will go ahead and meet. Now, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And uh, we were getting low. I noticed we were getting low on Communion um, cups, so we uh, I ordered some more. They came in a lot quicker this time. It didn't take a month and a half. but they, So I got another box and split them between the friendship and, and here and and uh, so we got plenty of uh, communion cups and, and bread. Right. Okay, let's see. Our Friday night prayer vigil. Last Friday we were going to meet live, and I was going to have a Bible study. But when we went back to, you know, level three, we decided not to. So um, I don't think. Karen's going to want to do it this week either. So if something changes, we'll let you know. All right? Any other announcements? Oh, yes. Not this Tuesday, not coming Tuesday, not the 28th, but a week 
from the 28th. Huh? No, not this week. Yeah, not the 29th, but the following. Thank you. October the 6th. Um, we've got to have, that's Tuesday, right? Okay, we've got to have a uh, council meeting, right? Got to have a council meeting to approve all the stuff that we did. Okay. All right. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Okay. Well, let's turn in our uh, hymnal to 381, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. We'll sing the first and the last verse. As what we've been doing um, as we go out there's not going to be Sunday school there will be no Sunday school so as we go out we're going to go out these doors and here's the offering plates on the altar in front of me uh, and so we're going to have our Thanksgivings and our concerns okay tip tippy is home she's home in Waverly they did sell the house yay I miss her but you know I'm glad they were able to get it so yeah so we need to remember Ed and he had his procedure and it went Okay, <laughs> but he's in lots of pain, so we need to remember him. Continue to pray for uh, Lily Brown. And I want to thank uh, Jamie for putting my uh, brother Bill on the prayer chain, but he died yesterday morning, about 2, 2.30 in the morning. So uh, he'd been sick for a long time. He had uh, only been out of the house, I think, he said like eight times in a year and a half, you know, so. And Betty? Great. Just don't have to go to Columbus again. That's fantastic. Okay. And your wife, Bill, she... Doing good? Uh, 
You made her mow grass. You didn't make her do it, but she did it on her own. How about Brother Phil? Ah, fan. That's great. That's great. We need to continue to remember Sam and Linda. Linda's doing better. She thought she would be here this week, but the doctor said no. He wouldn't do it for a while. So, Of course, Frank and Nancy. Nancy had her procedure, and uh, she won't listen to me. So maybe if she'll listen to some of you, you didn't need to be here. Did you hear me? You. <laughs> I said you didn't need to be here. I'm afraid something's going to happen. All right, Gail. Um, I I see Gail. I'll see her. Try to see her again today, but I see her two or three times a week, and uh, she's a little better. They decided to keep her at the hospital uh, for a few more days instead of sending, sending her back to Hillview, which uh, made her happy. Uh, we've got to continue to remember our country and um, our police and, and uh, firefighters and just thank these guys so much, guys and gals. Uh, Ann Smedley, she's not sure what it is, but she thinks she might have um, shingles. So she decided not to come. Yes? Um, I have a prayer request for, uh, it's someone I graduated with, but... Um, Ooh, back that far? Yeah, that far, but he, he uh, hadn't had his, the bottom of his hyphen moved. Oh. So he, uh, and the only hyphen lost his name. What's his name again? Lloyd. Lloyd. Uh-huh. Hyphen lost his name. What's his name again? Lloyd. Lloyd. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Chase. Chase is where now? He's he's in Saudi Arabia. Asher is. Uh, Afghanistan, headed to Afghanistan. Now, see, that just doesn't, that just doesn't sound right. Two of them in um, the Middle East and one of them in Florida. So it's, it's David is in Florida. So he's not getting to play. He's having to work. Yes, Glenn's got surgery coming up this week, I believe. Huh? Does that sound right? Oh, okay. All right, Frank. I know he's back there. He's hiding back there in the booth. And what day again? 15th? 8th. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, we got lots. Yes. Back and forth. Back and forth. So uh, Mary Lou and, and uh, Junior is coming back, and then you're going back. You're flying out. Okay. <laughs> Junior got cowboy boots in Texas. All right. That's right. Yeah, we thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Now, like I said, my brother Bill, he's got quite a family, you know. It's three sons, or two sons and a daughter, and then they've all got kids, and a lot of them have kids now. So, you know, we just got to remember them in their loss. All right, let's go, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just come before you thanking you um, for all of these things that you've brought to pass. We thank you, Lord, for Tippy being able to, to go home and for uh, Ed, you know, we, we just speak to that pain in the name of Jesus Christ that you would bring healing and wholeness to him. We thank you, Lord, for the good news with Betty and that she's able to uh, not have to go back to the, the doctor up there in Columbus. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for Phil and Sandra both. They're doing better. And for Linda, we just ask for continued strength. And uh, we pray for uh, Mr. Eichenlaub. He had his leg removed. And we pray for the boys, Chase and Ash, Ashley and David. And uh, just ask you to be with them and keep them safe, Lord. We uh, pray for Glenn and Karen and remember Glenn's uh, upcoming surgery on the 15th and Frank and his surgery on the 8th and Mary Lou and Junior heading back. <laughs> then Kathy going back to Texas. Just keep them safe, Lord. From not only from the virus, but all these flights back and forth. And uh, we pray for Faye and her loss and ask you to be with, be with her. Lord, we know you're here. There might only be 13 of us, but you said we're just a few are gathered in your name. And we're, we're, we're past that, so we thank you. Lord, be with us. Guide, direct us. Be here mightily, we pray. For it's in your name that we ask. And amen. Juanita? Okay, we'll pray for Juanita. Okay. All right. Well, we're still in our uh, series, Building Your Life on Values at Last. So uh, we've just got a few more of these. Now, next week is going to be a tough one. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll handle it. We're all adults, so we can handle it, you know. But, um, you know, as I looked in the Bible passages about fairness, it kind of hit me that you probably already learned how to be fair in preschool. You know, not not that you are. No, I'm not. I'm just. But you know, share your toys. Take turns. Cut the cake at equal pieces. Now you never had that trouble with your boys, did you? No, no, no. no. <sighs> but as adults, it seems like everybody's just living for themselves. Have you noticed that? And you cause us to ask, well, why should I be fair? Why can't I just live for myself like those people are? And be blunt, most people don't even try to be fair. They just get what they can, get everything that they can. You know, this isn't heaven. <laughs> and because of sin, this sure isn't a perfect world. And the Bible was clear about that. It says life is unfair. So if you ever want to do a real in-depth study uh, about things being unfair, just read Solomon's uh, book of Ecclesiastes. That's what we're doing today. You know, here, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, he looked at everything in the world and concluded life is unfair. 
And then he gives us some examples. Criminals go unpunished. Yep. Ecclesiastes 3.16 reads, Throughout the earth, justice is giving way to crime, and even courts are corrupt. I guess nothing's changed in 3,000 years. <laughs> in Ecclesiastes 8.11, in the New Living, right, Jamie? Is that what we're, they're calling it now? When crime isn't punished quickly, people feel like it's safe to do wrong. Now that's exactly what we're facing right now in this country. They can do whatever they want. You know? The news don't say a word about it. Killing these, you know, people, little kids and, and uh, innocent people and nobody says a word. And if you commit a crime, all you got to do is hire the right lawyer and um, they'll get you off on a technicality. And if it's a real, real heinous crime, then you could sell your story for book and movie rights. And even if you do get convicted, They'll get you off on parole in, in a few years. You know, it, it's, it's fallen human nature to try to dominate each other. That's what bullies are doing, you know, when you were a kid, the bullies. They're just trying to dominate you. Nations try to dominate other nations. Races try to dominate each other, even though I got news for the world, there's only one race, and that's the human race. And God created us. And all of our lives matter to Him. The rich try to dominate the poor. There's, sorry, guys, but oftentimes men try to dominate women. You know, wars are just really fights basically of oppression. The powerful dominating the weak. You know, look around. That's why two of the boys are going to be in the Middle East to keep the powerful from dominating the weak. And they're putting their life on the line to do that. And I'm very thankful. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1 says, I saw all the injustice that goes on in this world. The oppressed were crying and no one would ever help them. Their oppressors had power. Mm. You know, every year, more than 90 thousand Christians are martyred. Think about that. 90,000. Mostly in China and, or Muslim countries where you can get killed for uh, just for simply being a follower of Jesus. And Solomon tells us that nobody's helping these people. And he says it's not fair. And he's right. Then he says, politicians, <laughs> politicians are unethical. I could have stopped right there and just did the whole rest of the message on that. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 8 says, if you see injustice throughout the land, don't be surprised. For every official is under orders from higher up. So the matter is lost in red tape and bureaucracy. Wow. How close did that come, Jamie? Okay. <laughs> but, you know, that's where we're at. 
where we're at. Don't be surprised. And Ecclesiastes 10 reads, here is an injustice. Stupid people are given positions of authority. No, I'm not even going to ask. I'm not ask, going to ask for a raising of hands. But it's the truth. Ever, have you ever looked at an election and just thought to yourself, is this the best that we've got to offer? <laughs> you know, there are f a few good godly leaders, but there has to be more people with character, integrity, vision, and leadership who's willing to serve. Has to be. They gotta be out there somewhere. And scripture says when ungodly people hold positions of authority, guess what? Here comes abuse. Yep, and Solomon says it's unfair. And he's right again. Ecclesiastes 8.14 says, Sometimes righteous people suffer for what the wicked do. And the wicked get what the righteous deserve. Ever seen that happen? Yep. Does it bother you that uh, these unscrupulous corporations succeed? And that um, dishonest people get promoted while honest people are overlooked? Does it bother you that drug lords live in luxury while honest people are barely getting by? Hmm. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 15, Solomon says, It's unfair that some good people die young while some wicked people live on and on. We've all seen it. I know several of you have, have lost loved ones. It's just not right. Ecclesiastes 9, 11, in the, again in the, living, the New Living, says, In this world, fast runners do not always win the race. Wise men do not always earn a living. Intelligent men don't always get rich. And capable men do not always rise to high positions. Hmm. See, good guys don't always, you know, finish first in this world. Think about it. We pay guys who can dribble balls and throw them in a little hoop hundreds and hundreds times more than what we pay teachers who train our children. Yeah. I think it, uh, probably an average school teacher now makes, I don't know, maybe fifty-five, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000 a year. Anybody happen to know what the uh, minimum is for a ball player? There's minimums. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's the very minimum. The superstars, they get all kind of money. I mean, it's just crazy. So we, re we reward criminals, but ignore people who really have something legitimate to offer. And you, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Preacher, why don't God do something about it? Doesn't he care? Well, here's some reasons. <laughs> First, God lets you choose your actions in life. You know, I got up here this morning, let you choose what we were going to do. In Genesis, God said, let's make mankind in our own image. So that makes us different from the animals. Okay? We're different. 
God gave you a spirit, and that gives us the ability to have a relationship with God that animals can't have. I know some of you love your animals, your kitty cats and your puppy dogs and things, but they can never have that relationship. Have you ever seen a cat or a dog fold its paws and pray before they eat? Well, what are you laughing about? Is mine the only one that does that? Yeah. My kitty cat wants in long enough to eat, and then he, he wants back out. <laughs> so I do it. I let him in and put him, let him back out. But see, since we're made in God's image, we have the freedom to choose moral or immoral choices. We have that freedom to make those choices. And guess what? <laughs> There's consequences to the immoral choices that we make. So innocent people get hurt. And it's not fair. He said, well, why is that? Because God doesn't force us to love him. God doesn't force us to do what's right. Because you can't really love somebody unless you have the choice not to love. Hmm. All the terrible things that happen, they're not God's fault. They're results of evil choices that we make. All these riots and looting and everything that's going on, that's not God's fault. Those are choices that those people are making. But I got news for you. One day, God's going to settle the score. Ecclesiastes 3.17, it says, In due season, God will judge everything a man does. Wow. I don't know which one of these passages scares me worse. We're going to be judged by every word that we utter or everything that we do. Both of those are kind of scary, aren't they? See, because one day each of us is going to stand before God and give an account of our lives. And Isaiah tells us that God is a God of justice. And if I didn't believe that, I don't know how I'd go on. I'd be just uh, hopelessly depressed. See, because evil people get away with injustice all the time. People get treated unfairly and are oppressed, and nobody ever corrects them. But God says, in due time, I'm going to even the odds. You know, well, okay, fine. Why not now? Come on, God, why don't you do it now? Well, he's showing us that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's the truth. Some people say, everybody's good. It's just environment that teaches us to do bad things, selfish things. Uh-oh. Anybody? I know you all have children. Well, only one that does it. But um, you know, you parents, even if they're adults by now, you know that your kids were born selfish. It's true. It's all about me. Feed me, change me. And then when I get a little older, watch me, watch me do this, watch me do that. You know, we all want to think we're good. You know, well, well, you know, we might have some areas to work on, but we won't call it what it is, sin. Well, how dare you? 
I'm not perfect, but I'm no sinner. So God says, okay, okay. I'll let people make their own choices. I'll just let fallen human nature take its choice, take its course, and we'll just see what happens. Well, I, I think we're seeing what happens when, that, when God lets us make our choice. See, people are so inhumane to each other. And so God's showing us we really do need a Savior. Ecclesiastes 3.18, God is letting the world go on its sinful ways, testing mankind. Injustice shows what we're really like. And men will see that they are no better, hold on, no better than the beasts. We're seeing it. We're seeing it in the streets. We're no better than beasts. Rape and abuse and violence, human trafficking, children being killed, senseless acts of violence against innocent people. <laughs> Evolutionists will uh, argue, and I was going to talk about evolution Friday, but we'll get to it. We'll have Bible study eventually. But evolutionists, evolutionists will say, why are you surprised? You're just an animal anyway. And God says, well, you know, you might act like an animal, but you're not. So when somebody says, I believe man, mankind is inherently good, have them explain um, all the atrocities going on right now. Hmm. Yeah, one day we're going to be standing before God and we're going to want and need mercy, not justice. You know, if God gave us what we deserved, none of us would be here. Much less get into a perfect heaven. So God says, I'll show mercy to those who ask through my son, Jesus Christ. Now the Bible tells us that suffering can produce character. Notice I emphasized can. Not will, but it can. But I've known people who've suffered, but still have bad characters. Instead of becoming better, they become bitter. They, they, cynical, shrivel hearted people. So keep your eyes on God instead of this unfair world. And no matter what you're going through, if you're a Christian, let's listen to this, no matter what you're going through, if you're a Christian, God expects you to have a ministry. God makes all things work together for those who love and trust the Lord. But, but, but why did this happen to me? I didn't want a divorce. I didn't want to be a widow. Life just isn't fair. <laughs> You're right. Life isn't fair. And everybody has to face unfairness. So what does God want, want us to do when we face that injustice? First thing he says is accept it graciously. Jesus says, in the world you will have trouble. And since we live in a fallen world, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, don't be surprised 
at the terrible trouble which comes to test you. We've all been tested. We've all had trouble. It says, don't think that something strange is happening to you, but be happy that you are sharing in Christ's suffering so that you will be full of joy when Christ comes again in glory. So rather than complaining and becoming bitter, accept, accept it gracefully and let it develop your character. Start to preach on Christ is coming again. He is coming, church. He is coming. And I know for a thousand years people have said this, you know, when's he coming? When's he coming again? In my lifetime? And I've said this for years. Well, for you, yep, in your lifetime. Well, what do you mean? Well, because he'll either come again and take you, you know, to glory or to hell. Or you'll die. And so it's as broad as it is long. So it's in your lifetime. Okay, you got that? You see what I'm trying to to say? Second thing is, we got to respond lovingly to the people that hurt us. Now, when somebody hurts you, what do they expect? They want they expect you, they don't want it, but they expect you to retaliate. Seeking revenge. But God says instead of returning evil for evil, return love to the very people who are unfair to you. And Matthew 5 says, love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. Well, why would I want to do that? Because God tells you to. And it keeps them from, this is important, it keeps other people from controlling you. American scientist Booker T. Washington You've you've heard that name. You probably studied him in school. He said, I will never allow another man to control my life by allowing him to make me hate him. I will never allow somebody else to control me by allowing me or making me hate them. With everything that's happening right now, don't respond with hate, but lovingly seek justice. Abraham Lincoln loved the Confederate states, but he wasn't about to let them continue the injustice of slavery. She got that? He loved the southern states, but he wasn't going to let them continue. Martin Luther King said not to fight evil people in the world, but be like Jesus Christ and overcome evil with good. That's how we're supposed to fight for justice. Even um, when everybody and everything is unfair, maintain your integrity. Do the right thing. Number three, wait for God's help expectantly. First Peter says, a person might have to suffer even when it's unfair. But if he thinks of God and stands the pain, God is pleased. So when you know, you're going through injustice, guess what? God's on your side. The Bible says God cannot stand it when people are treated unfairly. 
He says, I will defend the oppressed and care for those who are treated in unjustly. God sees your pain and hears your cry. He knows that you didn't get what you deserved, but he's got a plan. So shine the light of God's love through your circumstance and you'll begin to see that God's working on your character because he could turn unfairness into something beautiful. Well, what do I do while I'm waiting uh, on God to settle the score? Now, you're never going to get an explanation in this life for the unfair things. But when we get to heaven, we'll understand. Here, all we need to know is God loves us and has our very best interest at heart. And eventually, he's going to reward us. These temporary troubles, the ones here in life, what we call life, are winning for us a permanent reward in eternity. All out of proportion with our pain. God will faithfully reward you if you continue to be fair no matter what happens. No matter what anybody else does. God will be fair. Let's pray. Praise you, Father, that um, you're a God of justice. and One day you are going to settle the score. Thank you that uh, you're in control and care about the hurts of people. Father, thank you that you don't just give in to, you know, give us justice. You give us mercy. And thank you for sending your son to be our Savior. Lord, use the injustice that we face in our life to build character and help us accept it graciously. Help me to do what's right regardless of what others do and to wait for you expectantly. and to know that there's an incredible reward all out of proportion to the earthly pain that we face. And that reward is for eternity. So if you've never invited Christ into your life, ask him now. Ask him to come into your life be master of your heart. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And amen. All right. Our closing hymn is um, 338, I believe. Let me look here. Yep, 338, where he leads me.
last verse. Will give me grace and glory. He will give praise and glory. He will give me Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority now and forever. And amen.